Um, so we will again record the sessions. As mentioned in the chat, uh, the recording session will be uploaded on YouTube in the next days. Um, take some time until that uh, we can just reconvert it and just upload it on YouTube. But everything will be uh, uh, online on uh, on YouTube uh, later on if you want to uh, rewatch the sessions and all the discussion and so on. Um, so for today's uh, uh, topic will be mainly administrations, installations of uh, the MISP instance. So we will start with the administration aspect uh, that uh, Sami will uh, will do. Uh, we will work on the installations uh, part two, so uh, requirements, server installation, and so on for the one that want to deploy. And then later we will have uh, sessions about uh, building your own community, um, which is I think quite important for the people that uh, starting uh, that will start to have a misfit instance either for themselves, for their team, or for uh, another community. So I let the floor for uh, to uh, to Sami. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, all right, so Alex did a quite good introduction of what we are going to see today. Um, so as I mentioned yesterday, we are running a training instance that you can use uh, to play with MISP, basically. So you can access it, uh, create data on it, create users, do whatever you want. Uh, the details to access this instance are provided here in the training pad that I will also paste the link in the chat. Uh, so feel free to to play with it. The only thing that I will ask you not to do is to change password of other users uh, because you are given the admin rights. So you can do basically whatever you want. Uh, but if you would be kind not to, to mess around with too many settings or uh, changing password, that would be kind. Uh, we can reset it back to to a known state, but we would prefer to avoid doing it. Um, okay, so for those who were not there yesterday that, that just want to have a small reminder about uh, MISP, some concept and the terminology that we use. Uh, in the pad, you will find some links uh, pointing to different resources, especially the cheat sheet. Uh, the concept and data model cheat sheet is really useful if you don't really know uh, what something means in MISP. So feel free to to check it out. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it. Another side note would be about the slides. Uh, so we are going to show some slides today, but if you want to, to have all the slides that we've produced so far, uh, feel free to also have a look at uh, the de dedicated repository um, that contains both the source files so that you can change them, uh, put your own team in LaTeX uh, or reuse some parts. Uh, as you wish, but you also provide the compiled uh, source so that you can immediately view the, the, the PDF. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. All right, so today is about administration. So what we will do, uh, we'll go through the different things that we have in MISP. So we'll go over the access control list, the, how is the ownership done, with organization and users. We'll go also over the different roles uh, that you can have in MISP with the permission settings. We'll have a look at the sharing groups uh, and how data can be shared uh, with synchronization to other MISP instances, but also uh, uh, by using the feed system so that you, in MISP, so that you, you, you already know in advance, uh, you don't necessarily need to, to be connected to other MISP to have information or to have data in your own instance. You can also fetch it from somewhere else. Um, then we have a quick look on how you can diagnose your instance, how you can change the settings, how you can view the different logs uh, that we have. We have two kinds of uh, log system, one that is more dedicated to the data changes and another one that is more dedicated to, let's say, general logging, uh, such as errors uh, uh, and issues. Then we see how you can update your MISP instance. It's fairly straightforward, but there are some gotcha uh, that you need to be aware of, uh, especially regarding the different knowledge base that we used. So if you were there yesterday or you know a bit about MISP, you know that we have uh, context, uh, and especially we have taxonomies and galaxies. Uh, and also object template and these need also to be updated whenever you update your list so that you have always the latest version of uh, of this uh, element um, yeah and finally we'll have a, a quick look on how you can generate uh, 
aggregated data, let's say. So how you can uh, configure your instance to send out periodic notification to, to your users. Uh, also how you can create your own dashboard directly built in in MISP. Uh, and hopefully if you have time, how you can, uh, uh, but I'm sure we will make some, some room that it's going to fit, uh, how you can install it on your instance quick overview, we don't, will not go into details. There is too much to talk about, but just the different ways that you can have a misp running and how you can configure it simply. Uh, and finally, yeah, community management, what are the best practices to run a successful misp community? All right. So that's it for our introduction. Let's, let's jump straight, straight to, to misp. So. This is the training instance. Feel free to join uh, this instance. Feel free to, to play around with the setting if you want to explore it on your own. Uh, so we'll start with, um, uh, I also see that we have some questions. Uh, and I really encourage everyone the, that have questions to ask them right away in the chat uh, so that I can all immediately reply or Alex can also reply. Uh, because we like it, we like our training to be interactive. Uh, so if there is something that is not clear when I'm showing stuff, please uh, uh, ask it. So topic of workflow, uh, I, I doubt we'll have time uh, to, to do it today. Uh, I can I can really provide a, a quick glimpse of uh, what it is. Uh, that could actually be interesting for administrator, but really we have a dedicated session about that topic tomorrow. Uh, it's a session about automation and integration, and we will go over the workflow in details. It's uh, yeah in the in the end of uh, tomorrow's session. Um, all right. So let's start with organization. Um, so if you want to manage your users, organization, and so on, you will have to go in the administration tab, and there you have access to all the links. So let's have a look at organization. So we can see that on this instance, we have a bunch uh, of uh, organization, even though that's just a test, test instance. Um, so let's have a quick look at what an organization is and what can an organization contain as data. Uh, so we have a name, so you can see it's pretty informal. So uh, it just gives you the name of uh, the organization. It can be basically whatever. You can see that we have some uh, funky names. Uh, we can have uh, some se more serious one, uh, let's say. Uh, and you can also have logos. That is also interesting. Uh, if, if you have an organization, feel free to upload the, the logo immediately so that it's rendered nicely in the interface. Then something that is extremely important is the UID. Uh, this is actually the unique identity that you have uh, in MISP that ties you, that ties you your users, uh, to, to, an or to to an organization. Uh, we'll go over it uh, later on in the, in the sharing group uh, and also uh, when we set up synchronization link between these instances. Uh, but this is really extremely, this is the most important thing basically. The, the name of an organization is irrelevant. What really and truly matter in the end is the UID. Uh, you can provide a small description, you can have a nationality, a sector, this is absolutely optional. Uh, and you can also provide a contact point. So if you're running a community uh, and you expect to have multiple organizations on your uh, instance, uh, we really encourage uh, site administrator to, to ask for, orga for organization to have a contact point so that if they ne ever need to, uh, to contact someone from there or if they need to, to well, reset uh, or do some users management for the user of that organization, it's always good to have a contact point. Um, then we have something that is called local. Uh, this is the local flag, or that's how, how we call it. Uh, because in MISP, we have two kinds of organization. We have the local organization, as you can see here, but you also have the known remote organization. So the difference between the two is, as, as you most probably know, MISP is a peer-to-peer -peer system meaning that you can receive data that was not created by an organization that have access to your instance. So for example, this, uh, the, this uh, organization, siammichael.com, uh, this organization uh, is a local organization, 
but doesn't have any users. It is local because it has been converted to local. <laughs> so that was actually a bad example, but uh, this organization has, has no users and it is known by this MISP instance because we received data that was created by this organization from a third party. In our case, uh, it is a feed. So we downloaded MISP data from a feed and that feed contained information about who created the, the event. Uh, and it turns on to be cmmichael.com. And that's why we have it in our instance. Uh, so if I click on known remote organization, you can see all the organization that are known by this MISP instance, but that don't have, uh, let's say, a, a true presence as uh, being able to contain or to have users. So the, the small side story about that that I find quite funny is uh, uh, at what point in time, uh, I think it was a few years ago, uh, one of my colleagues received a, a phone call uh, about uh, from a military organization uh, that they were scared and because they thought that Kaspersky had access to, to their instance. And uh, yeah, actually, Kaspersky didn't have access to their instance. It's just that they received an event that was created by Kaspersky from a, from a, a partner of theirs. Uh, so that's why we added this, this distinction. So if you know about an organization, it will appear uh, in this known or, uh, remote organization list. Uh, and if it is an organization that you created, uh, the, and that can create and have users on your instance, they will appear in uh, under the local organization. Um, okay, so let's see what are the steps to add an organization. So to do that, you click on add, uh, and then you have to, to fill out a form. This is the, the famous organization, uh, local organization flag. Uh, you have a small explanation of what it does. Uh, and then you have the organization identifier. This is basically the name. It's just a human-friendly name that you can give to an organization. Uh, it doesn't make its uh, unique identity. This is done by the UID, as I said previously. Uh, but uh, yes, you can give a, a name. So for example, we could say, uh, I don't know, uh, Super organization. Uh, if this is an organization that already exists, you have to, to reuse the UID so that you, you keep uh, consistency uh, when data will be uh, transferred from one MIST to another. Uh, if, you, if you don't do it uh, and you generate a new UID, uh, the two organizations, even though they will ha probably have the same name, they will not be considered as the same organization by the system because, again, you're using different UIDs. So if you've already created your organization, please ask uh, uh, search, uh, other instances uh, when you want to have access to reuse this, the UID you created. So in our case, to give you an example, uh, whenever Circle has access to uh, another MISP instance, uh, they will ask this other MISP instance to reuse this UID. So that when data gets synchronized, uh, everything is uh, 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 correctly known uh, about the ownership of the data. All right, then you have some optional field, some description. Uh, this one is actually interesting. Uh, we use it quite a lot, especially on our biggest instance dedicated to the private sector. Uh, this option allows you to bind a domain uh, to match the one uh, of the email address of the users. So for example, for Circle, uh, our email addresses are with uh, at circle.lu. Uh, and in our case, we, we have this that is enforced, meaning that if we don't have uh, meaning that all users that belong to the circle organization must have an, uh, an email address uh, from that domain. So if you're running a very large uh, community, it's good to do if it's just your private uh, MISP instance, so you don't have many organizations on your instance, you don't really have to bother about that field. Then the logo to have a nicer in user interface uh, and so, some other uh, 
optional field. And if you're happy with, uh, with it, you can just click Submit. Um, and you will have your organization created. It is uh, as simple as that to create an organization. <laughs> the only thing that really truly matters in the end is just the UID to, to reuse them correctly. Uh, now that you have an organization, uh, you can add user to that new organization. So you don't have, we don't have floating user in MISP. Every user belongs to one organization, as you will see. So if I click on list user, uh, you can see all the users here that have uh, an access to this instance, and they all belong to an organization. Uh, then you, if we ins inspect a bit this index, uh, you can see that we have some roles that we will cover soon. Uh, an email address. We don't have the notion of username in MISP. Username or basically email addresses. So this is unique. You can have only one email address uh, that act as the username. And then some uh, optional information that we'll, we'll go over. The last login, uh, I think by default it's not enabled on, a, on an instance. That I'm not 100% sure. But this indeed, is setting. Indeed, yeah. indeed, indeed, it's not enabled by default. Mm -hmm. So you can you can toggle it on in the option if you want if you're interested to see uh, when is uh, the last time a user logged in. Uh, and then if you are really paranoid and want to inspect or you or you suspect full play from a user, you can check this monitor uh, checkbox uh, so that you will have verbose logging activity and log entries uh, that were generated by this user. And last but not least, you have this disable field. Uh, so in, use, in, in MISP, you don't remove users. It's a really bad uh, practice uh, because events and data that are created belong to uh, an organization. They have been created by an organization. So this is data that is recorded, but you also have information about the user that created it. Um, so if you start to remove users, uh, you, you might end up in a situation where you don't really know who created that, that information. So the best practice to do is if you at some point give access to a user, uh, to your MISP instance, and then this user doesn't need to have an account anymore, uh, for example, uh, an employee leaving a company, you don't delete that user, you just disable it. Uh, he will lose access to the instance, but you will still keep all the record and all the, all the activities that were done by this user. All right, so let's see how you can add a user. So to add a user, you click simply on the add user uh, button. Then you have to provide an email address. This is the unique identifier. So we don't really care. Um, if, if you wish, you can already set a password. It's, it's not required. Um, best practice is not to set one and uh, let the user set it uh, uh, himself or herself. Then you have to choose an organization. Uh, as I said, organization, uh, all users have to belong to one organization. So you have to choose one. Uh, the best is for organization uh, would be to use the domain name. Um, that is something that I forgot to mention. Uh, but it's always best to use domain name as organization identifier because if everybody start to use uh, cert as the organization name, if we, we might end up in the situation where we will have 10 cert, and we don't know which cert is it, it is. Um, so yeah, all, if you don't really know what identifier you can put, uh, it's better to, to use a domain name. So you could just pick one. Um, and then you have to choose the role. So we'll go over the, the role uh, soon. But basically, you have three types of role, admin, or admin that are able to manage users of the of its organization and users. We'll go over the other one later on. Um, and then the PGP key. So 
this is quite uh, important that you provide a PGP key as it can send encrypted messages, uh, uh, like email notification, password reset links, and so on and so forth. So uh, really, we encourage all our users, and I think it's even mandatory on our private instance, uh, that uh, all users must have a PGP key. Uh, but really, if you can, please, uh, we really encourage you to uh to to use pgp keys and we even provide helper that automatically fetches pgp key from server if it based on the provided email address uh so yeah please use it it's always better uh, and then you have few notification and contact options that can be also edited by the users so you are the admin so you can choose this option for the user but they will also be able to edit these options later on when they have access to the to their MISP instance. So for example, this one, if it's checked, every time an event gets published, a uh, notification will be sent. So if, if, if you have an account on our instance for the private sector and you are spam with email, you just need to untick this box and save it. Uh, and you will not be spam anymore. <coughs> so, so also sometimes um, you want to ask the uh, the owner or the creator organization uh, some additional information or question that you can also do. Uh, and by checking or not this checkbox, you can choose to receive or not uh, this email. Uh, this is the checkbox that is responsible for disabling or enabling a, a user. Uh, and the last checkbox is about just sending credential automatically. So if you don't set a password, uh, it will generate one automatically on the fly and it will send it to the uh, email address uh, mailbox uh, if you have uh, set a PGP key because it will be sent uh, encrypted. And then once the user logged in in, in their MISP instance for the first time, they will be asked to change this temporary password. Uh, yeah, and I, think, it, I think this is answering question from Ricardo um, uh, about the password uh, reset. So automatically, when you create an account, uh, like Sammy was mentioning, is automatically sending credential if you check, check the box, which is send credential automatically. And you can do that even after the user is created. Uh, you can go in the list of users and just reset the one that you want automatically. That's why we recommend users to have PGP keys. If not, it's sending clear text. Um, and then people can uh, just log in and reset their, uh, their password. Um, there's an additional question, which is not really related to add user, but more previously about creating organizations. Uh, it was from uh, Jorg uh, about the anonymizations uh, to anonymize information of an organizations. So technically, um, there's no um, way to anonymize an organization. There is an old option in MISP that was from the early beginning, which was basically hiding all organizations with fake name. Um, this is something that we obviously don't uh, use and no one is actually as, as far as I know is using it uh, because it's really awkward to, to use as that models because the thing is everything is hidden and for sharing information uh, is not giving that much detail to the people and about who is sharing and so on but on the other hand there is the delegation of publications that we I don't remember if we, we quickly talk about it um, uh, last time but it's um, a way to ask another organization to uh, to get the publication and do the publication on your behalf. And I think this one is important if you want to hide your organization for publication and so on. Another option, and that's something that uh, I have seen in some organizations, nothing obliges you to use the proper name of your organization. So you can have alternative names. It's not uncommon for some organizations that are working in intelligence to have specific names per team without exactly mentioning the team it is. And you can set as as much as you want there. The only referent that is used by MISP is basically the UID. Uh, and I think you just showed to Ricardo how to use the PGP um, extensions. Exactly. And I also see that we have a question on how to turn off notification. Uh, this is the checkbox that you have to untick. Uh... There is something interesting in the recent version of MISP. We have a new notification systems where uh, people can select um, uh, a daily, weekly, or monthly notifications. 
Um, but just on the training instance, we are not running the latest versions. Um, so that's why we, do, we don't have it right now. It's a pity. But uh, it's, it's, it's quite handy when you, you have a lot of, of, of notification per day. You just see, see like, for example, weekly, and you basically get a nice um, uh, a nice emails showing the difference between a week or between a month or a day. If you have enough time, uh, we'll cover that part as well as the built-in dashboard capabilities. Awesome. Uh, when adding user, I didn't see the option of organization. Uh, that's weird. You should always have uh, the organization uh, select box displayed. Uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, I don't know which role you have there. Uh, maybe you're not admin ah. on your instance. Um, so that's maybe why. Um, so if you connect on the uh, uh, training instance, that you, you should have it. Maybe your role on training 21. Oh. Interesting. This is interesting. This is interesting. So the training user or organ. Oh, they changed. So what I said is is false. I said at the beginning that you were site admin, but you are not. You are just org admins. Yes. Okay. Ah, okay. So that's, that's fine. So technically, it's it's indeed correct. Um, so you are uh, okay. Some are admins. It looks like it's a previous training that uh, someone changed the permissions. But technically, it's not that much of an issue. <laughs> Um, you see, you have some that already have uh, admin, but it's good because you see that uh, uh, all the role is working in MISP. Uh, maybe you can just quickly talk about that. That's great. It's a good transition, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, so we had users, and now let's see about roles. Uh, so these are the roles uh, that are available in MISP. I think the first seven roles are there by default. Uh, but obviously you can create new roles and apply the different permission that that uh, these roles can have. Uh, so let's have a look, for example, at the difference between uh, admin and org admin. Uh, the site admin flags, it's basically, it's the God mode setting on, on your MISP instance. Uh, if you use it, you can do basically whatever you want. You can edit data of others. Uh, you can create account for every organization, you can create organization, you can create users, you can mess around with the server settings, uh, and so on and so forth. Then for the org admins, um, this is basically uh, the permission that allows you to create user for your own organization. So that's why you don't have the, uh, the, the select box uh, when you are adding an organization for to, to select in which organization you want to add your users to because you have the org admin uh, role uh, meaning that you can only add users in for your organization this is as simple as that uh, then i will only cover the role that really are interesting and make sense uh, for example sharing group editor uh, is a, it's a permission that allows you to create and edit sharing groups, uh, edit the one that for where you belong to that sharing group, obviously. Um, delegation access allows you to create delegation. So as Alex already mentioned, if you want to achieve anonymity or transfer the ownership of an event to another organization, you can do it via the delegation system. Uh, and you just, uh, from an event that has the uh, distribution, uh, organizationally distribution, you can delegate it to another uh, organization and also provide a bit of comment and the desired target distribution level to be applied once the transfer will be executed. Uh, citing creator allows you to create sightings or not. And yeah, this is basically it for the interesting options. Uh, something that you can also notice is that we, we have memory limit max execution time and search it per uh, 15 minutes colon. Uh, this can be configured per role. Uh, for example, we have the automation role uh, that should be used to manage and publish event of a specific organization or of organization. Uh, and you can see that the number of searches is limited compared to the other roles. But the execution time and the memory limit is much higher, meaning that with this role, uh, you can perform much heavier uh, queries against the, the MISP instance. 
uh, but you are limited to the to number of uh, searches that you can do and query that you can do. So if you have users that are really abusing your MISP instance, you can just create a new role that reduces the max execution time or the number of searches per, per minute, uh, and then assign them to that role. And then they, they will be blocked and they, would, they will have to wait uh, to, to perform additional queries. There is an additional question uh, from Mascure uh, about the tagger role. Um, the tagger role. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it allows you to, to tag, obviously, uh, to tag data. Uh, and I think it's, um, and I need well, to check, and I need to check. It's to attach and detach any text. If you go over the tagger, you have the info box. Um, yeah, but if you if you have, I think it's also related to the local tags, but that I'm not sure. Uh, I, I will have a look and come back to you after the break for for that, so that I can provide an accurate answer for that for that. Uh, because if you are already the owner of the event, uh, you could do it, or maybe I, I, I think I, I know what this is about. If if you cannot create data, but you could only you could only have, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, so you could, for example, create, uh, have roles that create attributes and so on um, inside your event, uh, but you are not able to attach tags. I, I think that's the, the, the correct answer, but I, I will confirm it after the break. Uh, I think it's like a special role that uh, can be used in the case where you have analysts that can create data, uh, but others that can only provide contextual information about it. But I will, I will check to, to give an accurate answer. Yeah, I'm surprised that the training instance is not set on the user, for example, because I just check on another instance and it's set for the user. So for me, it seems to be the setter getter for the... Uh, the but, uh, uh, as uh, the training users uh, used to be cited, means they, they could have done anything. So I'm sure people have played around with the, these uh, permission flags. Uh, and even as during trainings, I'm, I'm sure we, we've played with it and just checked and I checked uh, this checkbox. Yeah, and there's another question from Askur, but I think you will go into it. It's about the API hotkey. Um, so it's nothing linked to the PGP or an RSA key. It's really the API hotkey uh, to make automations against MISP instances, but I think we will go there later. Yeah, I can quickly go over it. Uh, so if you go on uh, my profile, uh, so you, you see the profile of your user, so you can see the role that you have, the organization. You can see the event that you created uh, and also the authorization key. So these are basically the API keys that you can use to access to, to the system and to, well, to, to integrate or interact with the system. Uh, so for example, you can see that uh, I have this API key that is used uh, by uh, one of my local dev instance. Uh, I have another one that is used to perform uh, statistics. Uh, and to, to create an API key, it's straightforward. You just click on Add Authentication Key. Uh, you can add a comment. You can provide the IPs that are allowed to use this authorization key. You can even put an expiracy date. And then you submit it. And then you, you will have the API key displayed once. Uh, then we keep, had... Keep, keep in mind with the authentication key, it's, it's really a model like a lot of SaaS services, for example, like GitHub. The key appears one time, we don't store it, uh, so we don't know about it, we cannot retrieve it. So that means if you don't copy-paste that key at the time that you, you see it, you just need to regenerate one. So it's super important. There is an old system, which was not the advanced old key in MISP, which was basically simple keys, uh, but this one is much more advanced and providing uh, much more security. Um, so please, if you use MISP and use scripting, don't hesitate to use much more root key for the different script and so on. It's much more granular, and then you can even revoke a key if this one got compromised. Yeah, that, that's a good comment uh, that you've made. If you are running an old instance and you don't have this root key uh, panel, that means that you are still using the old system and you have to migrate the old uh, authorization key system to the new one. And for that, you have to go into several settings and maintenance and click on what button. But we'll see that when we go into the diagnostic and setting part of the 
of this session. Uh, so let's go back to roles because uh, I think we have another is, question. Yeah, there's a question to create yeah, a role. An example role, it's straightforward. So you just have this button, add role, you can click on it. Uh, you can restrict this to site admin, meaning that only site admins will be able to assign this role to a user they will create. So for example, uh, the admin can, the site admin role can only be used and given by other site admins. Uh, for example, an org admin cannot give the site admin role to, to another user, obviously. Uh, so for example, test role, uh, permission, uh, this is more informal than anything. Uh, this one means uh, only, only managing the, the event organization. So you can see you have more checkboxes and this one even more with the execution. Then you can provide the memory limit. Oops. Then the execution time. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can select which permission you want to, to be used uh, by that role. And then you click submit and that's it, you have it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, as this is a, a training instance and people used to be site admins, uh, I don't know why we change it by the way, uh, but as people used to be site admins, I'm sure some uh, users created, created other uh, training users uh, just to, to, to play with it. Uh, okay, so we've covered ARC user roles. So we can have a look at uh, sharing groups. So sharing groups. Um, maybe it's also, before going into sharing groups, it's also a good opportunity to quickly review the different distribution level that we have in MISP. Uh, I don't think we've covered that part yesterday, so it's, it, it should not be repetition. So whenever you're creating data such as object, event, attribute, and even galaxy cluster, um, you can set the distribution level for that data. The distribution level is, is used in two cases. The first one is used to decide who can view this data. And the second case is, is used, how can it be synchronized and shared with other MISP instances connected to, to this one. So let's quickly review the distribution settings. Um, so we have your organization only. That means that the data under the your organization only distribution setting will only be visible by your organization. So by all users that belongs to your organization. The disk community only, um, we use the, the word community because we consider a MISP instance as a community. Because a MISP instance can host multiple organizations and so they kind of form a community. So that's why we use the community keyword. Uh, so this community only basically means every user that have access to this instance. Then you have connected communities. Um, this means it's a kind of a, uh, recursive, it means that your organization can have access to it. All users having access to this MISP instance can have access to this data. But with connected communities, that also means that all other MISP connected to this one can also have access to this data. And I think it's a good time to show a small diagram about that. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, this. Uh, Ah. There is another option if you want to, to quickly look into the events when the event is created. Uh, you have even a graph representations of the distribution levels. Um, so Sami will show a generic one, but within the platform, there is uh, even a way to see it, but I think we will uh, see it in a, in a minute. Mm, absolutely. Uh, so this one kind of uh, uh, summarizes what, what I've said. So. Uh, your organ is basically just your organization. This community means only what MISP instance. Connected community means this, uh, this MISP instance as well as other MISP instance connected to this one. And all communities means basically 
all instances recursively connected uh, uh, to these ones. So, for example, you can see that the gray misp instance is connected to the yellow and the red. Uh, and these three will receive data that is meant for connected communities. Uh, but the green and the purple one will not get it uh, with connected communities, but they will get it with all communities. So as a last note about the all communities, all communities means that it will that data will be propagated as far as it as it can get in the network of connected MISP instances. It doesn't mean that it will be sent to circles so or to us, or that it will be published to internet. Uh, if you are in this case where you have five MISP instances, where the gray one is yours, and then you have some partners uh, that are connected with this topology. Uh, with all communities, only these five instances will receive the data uh, and not, uh, not others. Uh, and finally, sharing groups. Uh, so sharing groups are just distribution lists where you can uh, select which organization can have access to, to the data. So for example, you can see uh, with the blue organization, these two can have access to the data, but you can also specify organization from other MISP instances if you want. Uh, so yeah, sharing groups are also share uh, when you are synchronizing. And so Alex also mentioned a distribution uh, graph. So I will also show that. So this one, if you click on this small, uh, this small button here, uh, you have a view that shows who can access this data. So for this event, uh, you have only the training organization that can, can see this data. This is because the distribution setting is set to your organization, your organization only. So if we were to change this distribution and use connected community, for example, now, if we have a look at the, uh, the network uh, diagram view, we see that more people have access. So uh, the event uh, can be viewed by our organization, so the training organization. It can also be viewed by the connected communities, which are all of these uh, MISP instances that are connected to this one. Um, and if we follow this arrow, it also means that uh, all organizations belonging to this community can see it. So, for example, you can see Circle can see it, CERN can see it, uh, uh, and a bunch of other. Uh, yeah, so that, that's it for uh, the distribution. And if you want to have a quick overview uh, of uh, how distributed are your distribution level, you can click on this uh, small icon and it shows a graph saying that, well, in this case, all data is uh, under the connected communities distribution. There is a very good question from EPF, strange nickname, but uh, he, um, asking about the difference between a connected community and a remote organization. Okay, so I yeah, will open this one up. So in MISP, you are not, a MISP instance is not connected to another organization. A MISP instance is connected to another MISP instance. And these MISP instances can have multiple organizations. So in this case, connected communities, uh, let's see if we have an interesting one. For example, this one. Uh, this event is shared with connected communities. And uh, this MISP instance, so our Igloshka.eu MISP instance, is connected to the MISP instance at CERT 80, which is, uh, I think, is the national CERT uh, uh, in Austria. Uh, and this MISP instance probably have multiple organizations. They probably have the uh, CERT 80, our CERT 80 uh, colleagues, uh, and most probably other partners uh, or collaborators in this instance. So by sharing this event with them, you will actually share it with all organizations that have access to the certainty MISP instance. Uh, now with uh, the connection with known remote organization that I was talking about, uh, this, to, to show it again, this organization, uh, this one, 
so let's say that uh, the, the quadruple A organization creates data in the third AT MISP instance. Uh, so they create an event, and then with a synchronization between third AT and our Igloshka.tu MISP instance, this new event is uh, transferred, synchronized, and saved in our instance. Uh, in that case, we don't know about the triple, uh, the, not the triple, the quadruple A organization uh, before getting this event. But now, as we have it, we know that this event was created by this quadruple A organization. And so we will have an entry in the known remote organization. But obviously, this quadruple A organization will not have access to our instance. It's just that MISP knows about that organization. I hope it was clear. If it's not, feel free to expand a bit on the question. Uh, that's an excellent question by Gabriel. And I think it's better uh, to, to, to have a look at it when we have a look at the data sharing, especially the synchronization part. But to, to, to give a, a high level uh, reply to, to this question, uh, connection between MISP instances and not organization, I repeat, uh, connection between, this, between MISP instances are asymmetric. So if you are connected to uh, the certity MISP instance, it doesn't mean that certity has access to your instance. Uh, in MISP for synchronization, we have two models. We have a push model and a pull model where you can push data to one instance and you can retrieve uh, using the pull technique data from another. So if you want to have fully symmetric synchronization link, uh, you have to, 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 to record two synchronization link. But we'll see that uh, more in details where we go over the, the synchronization. Uh, ah, this is an excellent question from Bern about the, the trust uh, in, a, in a connected network. Uh, this is a, a fundamental issue uh, that, that as, a, as a community manager, let's say, uh, we have to, to tackle. It's, it's extremely hard uh, to do it uh, if it's done correctly. So, for example, spamming uh, event and so on uh, from, from users, it's, it, you have to deal with it. So. You have, in, in that case, when we uh, encounter a situation where someone is just abusing a MISP instance, we just disable the user and try to get in touch with him. Uh, so far, we haven't had any full play, at least I know as, as far as we know of. It was only misconfiguration or uh, just bad scripting, sending all data from their sandboxing environment. Uh, but uh, yeah. Trust is tough. We don't have a mechanism in MISP to, to tackle this issue per se, but we have another initiative uh, under the Melisertes umbrella. Uh, this other initiative is another tool that is also developed by Circle, which is called Cerebrate, uh, that is meant to facilitate uh, this uh, this issue. Uh, I, I hope, or well, I think uh, Alex will probably go over in the community management. Uh, but if it's not the case, I can already show quickly how it's currently integrated in MISP. I think it's not a waste of time. Uh, so if you go in list organization, uh, it's not organization, sorry, it's in sync action and then celebrate. Uh, you can view all the Cerebrate servers that are connected to this instance. Uh, Cerebrate uh, are basically directories of organization and users and sharing groups uh, that you can use as a trusted uh, source. So I hope this one is up. It is. It's awesome. Uh, and so what we are currently viewing right now is the, all the organization known by the Cerebrate instance running at that URL. And what you can do is to simply pull this organization, fetch it, and save it locally so that you have the correct UID set to the organization name. 
uh, this is a way uh, that you can use to to keep track of your IDs and to not mess around with uh, uh, that issue. Uh, but now to actually provide, uh, how can I put it, like trust uh, for organization, uh, we don't have uh, a mean in MISP to, to do it. What you can do is to use tags and uh, assign a specific tags based on the reliability of uh, an organization. Uh, but that is a process that you have to do manually. So for example, if you receive data from a specific organization, uh, you have to manually tag it uh, using local tags that we didn't cover uh, in, the, in yesterday's session. And basically, you have global tags that you can add using this uh, glob icon, but you have local tags that you can also use, which are similar uh, than the global one, the only difference between the two is the locals are kept local to this instance, so they are not synchronized. Uh, so if you want to assign trust, uh, you would have to do it yourself. Uh, either manually or by uh, uh, using some script or workflows. Uh, yeah, this is tough. If you have other pointers or ideas on how we could solve this issue, uh, I mean, that would be awesome to, to hear about. Mm. Uh, wow, this is a really advanced question that we have today. Um, so to run clusters of misp instances that are considered as the same community. Uh, this is true, absolutely true. Uh, and this you can set it up in the synchronization uh, part. So when you set up a synchronization link, you can specify that, that another MISP instance should be considered as being the same community. Uh, and so uh, I don't have the diagram any anymore. Uh, but, and, and so when events are synchronized to this uh, special case of synchronization link, uh, they will not be uh, considered as another uh, community. And so they will not uh, uh, be downgraded to, to uh, a lower distribution level, basically. Uh, but that we can, we can go over it once again when we go and view the synchronization links. Uh, yes, this session is recorded. Uh, no, no, that's, uh, well, depends. So does Cerebrate allow you to indicate uh, an organization is no longer trustworthy? Uh, if you consider that indicates could be a tag, I mean, yes, you can add tags in Cerebrate to organization, uh, but you don't have a dedicated field for that, no. Uh. Uh, is the enterprise IDM? Yes. So we have, so for user management, uh, so, uh, we have multiple, uh, authentication mechanism that you can, uh, have in MISP, uh, uh active directory supported as uh, we have multiple one to, to be honest, I don't really know all of them. It's really specific. Uh, in, in, in later in the session, we'll have a quick look at what is available. Uh, but basically, you would have to, to uh, I think you have to, to create the users beforehand and then provide uh, a specific, uh, how is it called again, uh, authorization key or something like that. I don't really remember the, the detail on how you can achieve all of the different authentication mechanisms, uh, but you can use some of them, yes. Um, that and uh, I wanted to mention something else. Um, if you want to add an additional layer of uh, uh, security to the authentication without relying on uh, identity provider and so on, you can use the uh, MISP uh, one-time password uh, functionality 
it's just a setting that you have to to turn on and it, and each time a user want to log in into the instance they will be uh, asked to enter a, a code that they receive by mail so this is the easy 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 way to to do multi-factor authentication uh, but aside from that yeah uh, identity provider we have different integration uh, and if you're really interested in it, maybe we could cover it a bit uh, of, of that tomorrow. Uh, but this is not the purpose of uh, this session. Anyway, uh, the recorded video will be posted on YouTube uh, at the end of the week. All right. So let's have a look so we we've mentioned uh the distribution so now we can see sharing groups and how you can configure them so configure a sharing group it's in global actions and then list sharing groups um, in this interface you see all the sharing groups that are available in this instance so uh, Let's create one for the sake of the demonstration. So as a reminder, sharing groups are just a list of organizations that are allowed to, to have access and, and view the data. Uh, but for it to, to work, <laughs> you obviously have to configure it properly. So first, uh, you have to provide a unique identifier. Uh, if you don't provide it, a random one will be generated. And that's usually what you want. So that's not taking care of your ideas is always a good thing. Uh, and then you can add a name to your sharing groups. Um, so the true identity of a sharing group is done with the UID uh, and not with uh, the name. So if you have name collision on sharing group, it's not an issue as long as uh, UID are randomly generated, you will never have an issue. Uh, so for name, let's use what we what we have as an example here. So multinational sharing group, and then we have the releasable to field. So this is also a text field. Uh, this is not where you you list all organizations that can have access to this data. This is more uh, free text that should be used to describe who uh, this data can be released to. So in our case, the name is multinational sharing group. We could use something like uh, all organization uh, uh, in Luxembourg, for example, I don't know. And then you have a description field where you could even provide additional description about that. Uh, this checkbox make the sharing group selectable active. It's basically the same as the enabled and disabled uh, option for users. Uh, so once you create a sharing group, it's really not recommended to remove a sharing group, to, de to delete it. Rather, you should just make it unselectable. Uh, because if you have data that are still uh, under the sharing group distribution, uh, if you start to just remove them, uh, Miss will not know what to do with, with the distribution setting. So uh, uh, you will not even be able actually to, to remove the sharing group. Um, but yeah, so once you don't have any use for a specific uh, sharing group, uh, just uh, uncheck and check this checkbox. Next, this is where you will list all organizations that are part of this sharing group. So the organization, the creator organization of the sharing group is always included, obviously. But you can add more. So for example, let's add uh, the Funking Ariane Bank and let's add Circle. Uh, so these were organizations that were local to this instance, but you can also add organizations that are remote. So the known organization, for example, the quadruple A. Uh, then you can decide if this organization can extend this sharing group or not. Uh, let's keep it as is for now. And then you have to, to choose how can this sharing group be synchronized with other MISP instances. Uh, and how can the data also tagged with this sharing group be shared with other MISP instances? We basically have two modes. We have the roaming mode, 
and you have the non roaming mode where you have to list all servers uh, that, that can receive the data. So with roaming mode, that means that all servers that are connected to this one uh, and that, that have an organization that belong uh, to the sharing group that we are currently creating will receive the data. Uh, if you don't check this roaming mode, you would have to list all missed instances that can receive the sharing group. So in our case, this is all the instance that we have. So if I take the one at CERT80 that I mentioned previously, and uh, I don't know this one. In this case, uh, these instances will be able to receive the data as well as the sharing group, but not these as uh, they are not mentioned. If you wanted to be the to, to make the sharing group being shared with all instances, then we would have to check this roaming mode checkbox. Um, if you don't know what to pick, just pick roaming mode. It's the easiest. <laughs> and, and then you end up in this page. So this is the summary. It's really important uh, when you are new to creating sharing groups that you take time to read everything. Uh, so it really explains the type of sharing group that you are uh, about to create uh, and how it will be shared. Uh, and if you're happy with it, just click Submit. Uh, and then there we go. We have our sharing group. And now we can use this sharing group uh, as a distribution setting. So you click on Sharing Group, and then uh, you can pick it. Uh, the demo is multinational. Uh, multinational sharing group, then submit, and all organizations that belong to this sharing group, so these four, uh, will be able to view the data. So we have a question about event or publish and the received email as contact reporter request. Uh, so you, you have two checkboxes uh, for that to, to be notified. Um, you have this one. This is whenever an event gets published, uh, you will get a notification. And this this one is uh, to be uh, to receive uh, emails when uh, the site administrator uh, use the contact reporter feature. Uh, Kerberos, I, I don't know. LDAP, I think so, yes. Uh, I think that it is supported. Alternative to specify sharing via sharing group. I'm not sure to understand that question. Uh, drawback or side effect to use sharing group. Uh, Um, well, less people can have access to your data. Uh, if later on you decide to, to make it, uh, to change it from sharing group to uh, another distribution level, uh, it will work straight away. So I think one of the most common use cases, is you have an incident that involves, let's say, a partner. You create an event, you create uh, a new sharing group that includes your organization and your partner in it. Uh, you set the distribution setting of this event to this sharing group so that both you and your partner can view the data. Uh, and then once the incident is over and you want to release the, the information to, to the public or to, to other partners, you just change the distribution setting of your event to, let's say, connected communities. Uh, so I don't see any, any drawback for that. Uh, for side effects, I don't think either. The, I would say the it's not a side effect, it's neither a drawback, it's more of an issue. If you have misconfiguration of uh, organization UIDs on instances, 
or misconfiguration on synchronization link, the sharing group might not propagate from one, inst one instance to another. So it, it makes things more complex uh, because of uh, uh, the intrinsic logic that are sharing groups. Uh, but aside from that, no, they are just like a, a subset uh, of organization that can have access to, to it. Multi-factor authentication through emails. I can show the option. Uh, I think it's in security. So if you enable this option, email OTP enabled, an email will be sent containing a, a, a small token that you can that you have to enter whenever you log in. Okay, so that was it about sharing groups. So now let's have a look at synchronization. Uh, let's quickly check. Okay, we are a bit out of time. So let's, let's speed up a bit. <laughs> so uh, for synchronization link, to configure a uh, synchronization link between uh, your instance and another one, you have to go to list server. And then you can view all uh, connected uh instance that you that you have uh, let's take one that probably works for example this one no, this one doesn't work this one is working awesome so we can see that you have some uh, connectivity check widget that you can use uh where you can see the the, the remote version of uh, of the of the instance uh, if it is compatible or not and the different settings uh that you can have for that uh, synchronization so let's create a new Google synchronization to see how it works. So to create one, you click on new server, uh, and then you have to enter information about it. So the base URL, this is the, the, the URL that you, you need to connect to this instance. So in our case, if we were to, to create a synchronization link to this training instance, we would use just you, uh, the, the URL of this instance. Uh, so that I will do it like this. And then you have to give a name. Uh, this is just for you to identify the instance. It's just used for display purposes. So I could say like a training instance. And then this is where things are more complex and where things can go wrong. So this is really something that you should pay a lot of attention to. When you create a new synchronization link, this is about uh, specifying who is the owner of the remote instance. If you were to, 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 to select the incorrect owner, uh, you might leak some data. So uh, in our case, uh, this instance, igloshka.eu, the owner of the instance is the training organization. Uh, if we were to use one of uh, our instance for the private sector, so misbrief.circle.lu. Uh, I could use something like this, misbrief circle. Uh, in that case, the owner of this organization is circle. So in that case, I would use circle. Now, what happens if I don't select circle? Well, if I select my organization, so for example, the training, uh, uh, ignore that for a moment. So if I if I choose this training organization, that means that all the data that the training or organization can see will be sent over uh, to the misbrief circle. And this is not something that we want, obviously. We want only the data uh, to be uh, accessible to circle to be sent over that organization. So in that case, we would have to pick circle. So uh, as you remember, you have the local and the external organization. So if this instance were to belong to quadruple A, uh, uh, you could also use an external organization that you know of. 
And if you haven't created the organization yet, uh, there is still the third option, which allows you to create an organization on the fly. Uh, but you obviously have to know the UID of the organization. Um, yeah, so it's it's better to create the organization first, uh, because you can provide additional details such, such as the sector, uh, uh, the contact email address, and so on. But if you are uh, lazy, you can just do it from this interface. Um, okay. Then we have the authorization key. So this is uh, the authorization key or the API key of a user that is located on this instance. Uh, this authentication key will be used to authenticate, I guess, uh, this uh, MISP instance and allows you to fetch data from this instance and save it locally, or to push, if you have the permission, of course, or to push data to this instance. Uh, so in that case, if you are in control of this instance, it's easy for you. You just go into uh, uh, my profile um, and then authorization key, and you add your authentication key. Uh, and if you don't have uh, control over this domain, you just ask the site admin to create what user for, one user for you. So now, next question. Which user and specifically what role uh, should I use for a synchronization user? Uh, we have a dedicated role for that. Uh, let's go to this role. Uh, this is the sync user role. And you can see that it has one special uh, check mark than other, unless the site admin, because he has, he has everything. Uh, but it has one special uh, check mark compared to others. I will not go into the detail why, but basically it just allows you, uh, it just allows sync user to create an event on behalf of other organization. Um, but yeah, so if you want to set up a synchronization link, if you have access to the instance, create one new user and set it as a synchronization uh, a sync user role, and then create an API key for this user and put it there. Um, I think that's it. So that will create a one-way synchronization link where this instance, so the Igloshka instance, will be able to download data from MISPRIF. And if it's uh, if the authorization key belongs to a sync user in MISPRIF, uh, our igloshka.eu instance will be able to push data or to synchronize data uh, to MISPRIF. Then you can select the different synchronization method that you want. So if you want to upload data to the remote instance, you check push. If you want to be able to download data, you check uh, pull. You have the same for sightings and you have the same for uh, Galaxy Cluster. Uh, then you have a more uh, miscellaneous uh, settings where you can request an event to be unpublished, which we uh, discourage. Um, you can also request the event to be published without sending an email. Uh, and you have uh, some more options uh, like proxies and self-signed certificates. Uh, and if you're happy with it, just submit, and then you will have your, in your uh, instance created. Uh, now, before we continue on synchronization, let's see if we have a question. Then... Oh, I need to re read again that this question. If my instance pushes data to other instances, then other instances info will appear in my instance list server. Uh, I think there are some mix up in concept here. We will not see my instance info in the list of server. Yes. Okay, so the last instance kind of uh, 
uh, summarize it. So if you push, if your instance push data to another one, the only thing that will appear is basically uh, data that will appear in the uh, event index. And your instance will not appear on the server list. So I think that's answer the question. So if you push to another instance, uh, they will not see your server in this list because they don't have access to it. Ah, that was the reply was just of course. <laughs> it was just below. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. How can we calculate this storage SSD, for example, if we pull feed? Well, that, that depends on the amount of data you plan to, to use. Uh, so I see that someone posted the, the MISP sizer. Um, I would say it, maybe at some point it used to be more or less accurate. Right now, it's not the case at all. Uh, unfortunately but uh i mean it the storage really depends on what you want to save if you want to save the actual data uh you would need more than if you just want to cache it uh we haven't talked about caching uh but it's a quick way to see only correlation and to only fetch data that have correlation entries in your system so you really can get a lot of uh, uh, space saving, I would say. Yeah, 72 terabyte of disk, uh, uh, this is insane, insanely high. Uh, it's not the case. Even for our instance, we we don't use that, that, that much. Uh, but again, it really depends on how many attributes and the type of your attribute. I mean, if every attribute is a binary, it will, it will, you will need more storage than if all your attributes are IP addresses, obviously. Uh, yeah, so I would say one terabyte is for normal usage is much more than, than enough. Uh, okay, so last thing about uh, synchronization. So we've set up our new synchronization link. We, test, we tested it if it works. What can we do with it? Well, first of all, we can browse it. So if you click on this magnifying glass, uh, you can view events uh, that are uh, contained inside this uh, other MISP instance. So as you can see on the top, we are currently viewing the event index of that remote MISP instance. So you can browse the index. You can even browse individual event so that you can see the data. And if you think that this is something that you would like to have locally in your MISM instance, you can click on fetch this event on the sidebar or just click on the download uh, button here uh, in the index. And so what it will do by clicking on it, it will take this event and save it locally so that you will have access, uh, local access to this event. Uh, and then you have the actual synchronization actions. Uh, so let's quickly check what is enabled. So we have pull, push, and caching for this one. So with this one, if you click on pull all, it will create a background job that will fetch all events that are contained in the COVID MISP instance. If you click on push all, it will take all events uh, on this instance and it will push them to the remote one. When I say all events, obviously I meant all events that can be shared with this instance. Organization only event, sharing group event, and this community event uh, will not be shared. And then caching, uh, it will just take all the data that is available, hash it, and put it in a fast lookup database so that you have uh, quick correlation information about it without having to download everything locally. Uh, and last but not least, we can see that for some of the synchronization techniques, uh, you have some rules that are shown there. Uh, this is what we call the synchronization filters. Um, it, is, it can be used to filter out 
data to be synchronized or to be pulled, uh, so to be pushed or to be pulled from an instance. So let's have a look quickly. So for the push rules, what we have set up here is that, I will zoom it a bit, all events that have the TLP red tag will be blocked and will not be pushed. So with this rule, that means any event that have a TLP red tag attached to them will not be synchronized with this instance. Uh, so you, you can play a bit with this, uh, uh, with this interface where you can uh, blacklist uh, tags and allow list uh, or whitelist some tags uh, so that you can apply filtering during synchronization. You can do the same for organization. So this is for the push and you can do the same for pull where you can also select uh, the tags that you want to blacklist and the tag that you want to whitelist uh, so that you have more controls over what you want to ingest and what you want to, to, to push or to, to send to, to other instances. Uh, so let's see. Nuclear relation engine will also reduce storage size. Yes, uh, if you are using uh, an old version, I really advise everyone to update to the latest one because we've made a huge optimization on the correlation engine. And now it's uh, much, much faster, especially to load, to load large events. And it's, uh, uh, the gain in space is also insane. If you had a huge amount of correlation, now it's, uh, uh, it's a problem that is almost solved. Because uh, it's much better. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it, is it only admin that can browse external events? Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, only site admins can create synchronization links. And so only site admin can uh, explore remote misinstance and trigger pull and push. Uh, caching is suggested best practices. Uh, yes, uh, I advise it at least. Uh, personally, I prefer to, to cache events uh, locally rather than downloading them uh, because having them it's not always useful unless you, you, you know that you would need the data. Uh, but if you want to have just information about correlations, uh, you will have it in the interface, but also include it uh, in, the, uh, in the export if you use the API. So here we have the related events that are known in this instance. Uh, hopefully I will find another one. Uh, this is uh, the correlation that are known uh, that are known by MISP uh, where the data is contained in another feed. And if we would have a correlation for another server, a MISP server, we would have another entry just below this one or just above that says that this data is also included in another event from another MISP instance. So if it is for correlation purposes, I would say uh, cache it. It's a quick. It's a quick win. It's, it doesn't take much uh, space on the disk, and it's like lightning fast to to check if there is a correlation with a remote instance. Now, if you want to have this data locally, to also be able to export it uh, to your protective tools. In that case, you would have to to, to download the data. Yes. It really depends on the use case. Um, Uh, so, for example, to give a, a practical example, uh, we'll have a look at, at feeds. Uh, but quickly, because we are kind of running out of time for the break. Um, so, feeds, uh, and I will come back to, to this caching just after introducing the feed. So, feeds are basically repositories that contain data uh, that can be downloaded. Uh, so if you have a look at the circle OS in feeds, you can also explore a feed similar to how you explore an, a remote MISP instance. You can see the, the list of events that are contained in this feed, and you can also ex, uh, explore the content of, this, uh, of the, these events. Uh, so this is for feeds. Uh, 
we have different uh, feed format. So what we just explore is a for, uh, feed format under the BISP format, but we also have CSV format. So if we have a look at it, ah, this one doesn't work anymore. It's okay. Shall we look at another one? So this is uh, data from this, uh, this field. And you can see it's just a CSV that is parsed and rendered as attributes. And you can download it and ingest it in your instance. Uh, if you are just starting out with MISP and you want to have data, uh, I think one of the easiest ways to just take the circular async feed uh, and few others, enable them, and then uh, download data that are stored in this feed, and you, you, you will have data in your MISP. Uh, now to come back to the caching. Uh, if you want, uh, for example, to have all uh, IPs that should be block listed uh, to, to later on be able to export this data to your protective tools. Uh, in that case, I would fetch data that are stored in this feed. Uh, however, if you are interested to see correlation with store exit nodes, for example, for these feeds, uh, I don't see a point to download this data locally. It will just take, take up space uh, for nothing because what I'm interested in when I'm doing analysis, uh, is to see a correlation to say, oh, okay, this IP address uh, that were used in my incident is actually a Tor exit node. Uh, and so in that case, I would not download this data locally. Uh, I would just cache it. Uh, so that when I'm browsing event uh, or when I'm exporting data, if there is a, a match with this Tor exit node, uh, I would see it immediately without, heavy, without uh, having the data locally. Thanks for sharing the uh, HDoc document. Um, I think that's it for feed. Uh, let's quickly go over if there is something important that should be mentioned. <laughs> uh, there is only one thing that I really want like to would like to emphasize. Whenever you are pulling feed is when you are pulling feed that are not under the MISP format. So for example, if you are pulling a feed under the CSV format, you can see that you have a target column here, and you can have two configurations for non-MISP feed format. You can have the new fixed event. Uh, and, uh, actually, we have three. Uh, new fixed event, fixed event, and new event at each pool. So let's have a, a quick look at the difference. Uh, this one is not totally completed. That's interesting. I think we have a small bug here. Uh, but anyway, so if you are configuring a feed that is not a missed feed, so if it's a simple CSV or free text, uh, you, you have to, to choose between these two options. So new event at each pool, or fixed event. Now, what does that mean? Uh, if you choose fixed event, it will create an event like this one. And each time you pull this feed, so you fetch data from this feed, it will keep this event updated. So it will remove attribute that have been removed from the feed and it will create new one and even updates uh, others, uh, which in the end makes that you have only one event for one field. On the other hand, if you choose to have new event each pool, it will create a new event at each pool. And you can have a big issue if you pull it too often and the feed doesn't change much. For example, if you have very static feed and you pull it every hour, that means that every hour you will create a new event with the same data over and over. And what will happen is this data will cross correlate and it will fill up the correlation table, table quite fast. So now with the new correlation system, we kind of catch this uh, edge case, uh, but it will just fill up your instance in the end with a lot of duplicated data that is that can be difficult to deal with. So if you want to really see how the feed evolved over time, uh, 
uh, that's fine. Use the new event at each pool. If you are not sure which one to take, just take fixed event uh, so that you don't uh, end up with a huge problem to deal with later on. There is a good question from Nick um, regarding the, the use of, of the CM and uh, what do you do or to import the, the feed. Uh, and it's, it's really nice that you just show there with the feed import as a, as a MISP event. Um, really, the recommendation if you want to benefit from all the features of MISP API and your CM integrations uh, is really to use um, this import as MISP event. Uh, for example, fixed event, which is indeed the recommended way to avoid uh, overloading. Uh, and then you can apply filter when you search. So for example, if you use um, MISP 42 Splunk, which is a connector for Splunk, you can create filter rules. And one of those filter rules are, for example, for the warning list. Then you can create and limit the false positive that you get from your feeds directly within MISP and benefit from MISP filtering out your uh, false positive or the warning list, for example. So that's, I think, quite important uh, uh, if you want to use the feed uh, format. Then you can even cache the feed. That's what Sami was mentioning too. Uh, but then you cannot use when it's cached for the uh, for your CM because you don't have access to the direct um, the direct data. So to answer, remove attribute will be soft deleted. I think so. Yes. Uh, maybe they would be are deleted if the event hasn't been published. Uh, but. Uh, Right, it's a good on question. The top of, on the top of my head, I would say soft deleted. Okay, I, I thought it was an hard delete, but uh, okay, good, uh, good questions. Uh, I think we have to leak it up. Well, <laughs> to, to be honest, for me, it depends on the, the published state of the event. Yeah, indeed, yeah. If it, it, if it has been published, there is no point to hard delete it, so I would soft delete it. And I think we have that logic in the code, so that's why we never thought about it. Uh, yeah, for, for that one, uh, for the SOAR incident response tool, uh, I have nothing to, to, to suggest. <laughs> Use okay. open source tools. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, 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 we try to be quite an open on that. So that means you can use whatever you like and so on. Um, I mean, we know various tools. Uh, people are using some proprietary tools. Some are using some open source tools and so on. Um, for incident response and case management, obviously, some are using the Hive. Um, some are using other tool sets. There's recently a tool from Airbus um, doing uh, case management too and so on. Um, those ones are interesting tools. They have misconnector, uh, so you can benefit from, from that. I know a lot of, of SOAR uh, property one, like um, uh, the Mister that has only changed names, but this one has a lot of plugins for MISP uh, too and other uh, services that we provide as Circle. Um, so there are many of, of those. I mean, the first thing to look it, to look it up is obviously if there is a connector. No, maybe on the MISP site, and that's maybe an advice if you, you integrate with MISP, double check what they really support in MISP because there are still some tools that are very, very limited connection-wise with MISP where they just pull, for example, attributes, but they don't handle objects, they don't handle taxonomies, uh, ta uh, specific galaxies, filtering on that and so on. So where it's like just pulling some attribute and that's it. So uh, uh, for, for is there is already very good integration, for example, for Splunk. Uh, I, can, I, will, I will drop the link uh, to the connectors, which is an open source connector too for Splunk uh, uh, search uh, indexer and so on. And that works pretty well too. Um, but just be careful when you review tools. Sometimes they say misconnector, but the misconnector is really, really minimal. Uh, some tools are much more advanced. Um, but some are, uh, I would say, less advanced. It's just like, for example, treat everything as attribute and they don't care about object and things like that. Um, ah, that's a good question. So regarding service now, I know there is a tool, a connector for me, but I think it's still quite minimal. It's really attribute-like. Uh, I think the Hive is still a bit more advanced for case management, um, but I think it's, it's, it's quite equal nowadays, those two. Um, so it's really depending of, of the kind of... of uh, um, extension you do and so on, because I, I know a lot of people that are uh, bundling their own script with their uh, incident response tools and so on. Um, I will drop some link in the chat uh, for existing open source tools, like the one from uh, uh, from Airbus, uh, which is an open source tool for doing case management. This one is quite interesting because it's really going deep into misconnectors. Obviously, the I version 4, uh, the, uh, this one is open source. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is a very good command there. Uh, some connectors are also will pull all your missed data in your top black box, but will go give you any way to go or the other way. So that's that's really a mantra at MISP. We always want people to be able to use the data. Uh, so it's working in both sides. But indeed, some vendors are looking in some, um, I will not name it, but I think uh, will, a well-known uh, network vendors, for example, have this bad habit of, of like pulling all data, but they don't say all they use it and they don't even uh, provide a way to export back the data. Um, so it's indeed a very good point. Um, so like Sammy mentioned, I think the thing that is really important is try to have the full chain being open source. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense, if, especially if you have a lot of at least capabilities within your team to do that. If not, it's a nice way to even grow up uh, and, and, ex and extend your capabilities within your team. I've seen some organizations that started to build a very simple pli pipelines. And nowadays, they have like very com complex systems. They are even maintaining some open source component and so on. Um, so, we, And then at the end, the, the staff gain a lot of, of capabilities and, and new idea of, of, of donations. Um, yeah, so... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> curl, for example, and, and basic scripts like that, you can do already a lot of things. Uh, tomorrow, you will get a, um, a more detailed uh, sessions regarding uh, API and so on. You'll see that we have some Jupyter notebooks describing all the API. The REST API is like super extensive. Uh, you can do really a lot of things and you have tons of parameters to, to play with. So the, as long as you have, for like, example, connectors that support the REST API of MISP properly, that's already a good sign because then you can pass all the parameters on the REST API. But look, I would say, unluckily, some vendors are doing the opposite and they tend to, for example, have really basic connector where you just type, for example, oh, I just want IP address source, but you have no parameters like, uh, you know, time ranges, uh, specific filtering on tags, enforcing warning lists, and so on, um, which is sometimes a pity for some, some vendors. So uh, it's really depending on the vendor. I, I'll pass in the chat some, some, some additional reference. Maybe, Sammy, you want to add something? Yeah, that, that comment was just a joke. Uh, it was just saying that uh, some connector might just not even rely on the uh, MISP data structure and just do regex matching to, to, to extract IPs and domain and URLs and save them inside the CSV. <laughs> That's just it. Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, a, a lot, I, I, I know of an antivirus vendor that was doing that with a lot of, of even complex parsing of sticks files and so on. And they were just like grapping for IP addresses and didn't care about even the format. Even if you have a flag saying at one point, this was in the observables and not an indicator. So, um, so you have indeed to be careful on, on, on such kind of connections. Um, we, we try to be, uh, for example, for us, we, we welcome any vendors contacting us for advice and so on. We have even some trade intelligence vendors that are contacting us to show their misformats export uh, or to expand it and so on. So we we are more, more than happy to help any vendors on that to make it better. So if you have relationship with a vendor and you see that they don't exactly know what they could provide in MISP and, and we are even vendors and you want to have better integration with MISP, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can we can give a hand and uh, make it better. And at the end, it's a benefit of everyone, the MISP users and the one using the tools because if the components are working well together, people tend to keep those components and they, they keep it on the long term on their infrastructures. Yeah, I think we've covered enough of uh, synchronization and and feeds. Uh, hmm. All right, uh, I think it's a good time to to do a break uh, now. Yeah, sure. I, I will I will continue to answer some of the questions in the chat um, in the meantime. Sure. So if you have any questions, uh, and then we start back at. Um, at Let's at take four. a. Uh, I'll, we can take a, a fifteen-minute break. It's I, I would take a, a, a small, a smaller one break because we are kind of running out of time. Okay, so we can do ten minutes. Ten minutes is fine. So see you all at fifteen, Right, so 
Welcome back everyone. <clears throat> uh, so now in this second part of the session, we are going to have a quick look at um, uh, diagnostic of uh, a MISP instance, a uh, quick word about the, the logging that we have in place, how you can change settings, uh, and how you can update your MISP instance. And then we have a small overview of two brand new features uh, that came out uh, the, um, two months ago, and well, actually one month ago and a few days ago. Uh, so for uh, people that are already used to MISP, uh, you might learn a few things. All right, so let's start with the diagnostic. So as a site admin, uh, if you go in the administration tab and then server setting and maintenance, uh, you are shown a small table that gives you the overall health of your instance. And by, by health, it's mainly the settings that are uh, set in your MISP instance or not. So you have some critical settings. Uh, it says incorrect, but most of the time it's not that they are incorrect. It's just that they are not set. So it falls back to default value, but it's always better to, uh, to set them. Uh, so we'll not go through all settings because we have so many of them. So that I let that for you as a homework. Uh, but I will just explain how things are organized and how things are working in MISP. So if you go on the MISP tab, uh, you have all the settings, uh, I would say generic setting, uh, uh, having uh, influence on how MISP behaves uh, and some of the features as well. Uh, for example, this one uh, is shown in red. This is a critical setting that says that the emailing is disabled. Uh, and it says that uh, no outgoing email will be sent by MISP. And even though it is a setting that we've set, uh, it's discouraged by MISP to disable emailing because they you will not be able to contact people. You will not be able to reset uh, password by sending PGP encrypted mails and so on. So uh, it, it says that it's bad, but it's also just a highlight to highlight that it is potentially an issue for your instance. Uh, then we have anything related to encryptions, anything related to proxy, and then the security. So if we, if you remember at the beginning of the session, we've discussed about uh, authorization keys and that we used to have an old system and now that everyone should use this uh, a new authorization system. Uh, this is where you can enable it. So just have to toggle this advanced auth keys system uh, if you are using an old instance. And if you want to migrate all your previous uh, API keys and so on, you just have to click on one button uh, that is uh, explained here. Um, then I don't think there is anything aside from the email OTP that we've talked about. So if you want to enable OTP uh, done by MISP, just turn this setting on and that's basically it. Um, yep, yeah, so let's continue. Then you have the plugin tab. Uh, so this shows the settings that are available for all plugins. So if you remember, we presented yesterday the enrichment system that allows you to enrich attributes to provide additional information. Uh, we saw, for example, that you can uh, enrich a CV to also include all the details related to that CV. Uh, we also saw that you can uh, get the geolocalization of an IP address using the geolocation service. Uh, and this is, uh, this is where you can configure these uh, external services, so in enrichment import, export, and action. Uh, and we have other integrations. So for example, the, the zero MQ, which is a publish subscribe uh, channel, same for Kafka. We'll have a more detailed session about these tomorrow for those who will join us. But basically this is where you can configure all these things. Uh, a fairly new feature also is the uh, new background job that we have instead of being managed uh, by cake php 
they are managed by the uh, server itself, by the OS itself. Uh, the new correlation feature that was introduced one month ago that allows you to change the correlation engine where you could have correlation without ACL applied to it, which is much faster. Uh, but obviously, if you don't have ACL, um, that can lead to uh, information leak, uh, depending on the community on the, or the type of the uh, community you are running. So be careful with that, but uh, yeah, just for your information. Then you can manage files. Uh, so for example, organization, uh, logo, and so on, everything can be managed in this interface. And the, the two other tabs, worker and diagnostic, we start by workers. Uh, in MISP, we heavily use worker for a bunch of tasks. So all emails that are uh, to be sent, uh, they will not be done in line with your request, that will be uh, done by a worker. So whenever, you, for example, you publish an event, uh, it will create a job entry to send notification to all users uh, that uh, subscribe to the notification. Uh, and so a worker will pick up that job uh, and start sending emails to all of these users. Uh, yeah, we have a worker dedicated to, to perform a very, um, how can I say that? Uh, a very uh, large update, let's say. So if, you, if we have to migrate a database uh, and stuff like that, it can take a lot of time. So to avoid blocking you, it will be performed by a worker. Uh, long, so a bunch of... Long-lasting. Long yeah, it's yeah. long-lasting processes. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. So exactly, that's it. Um, yeah, so bunch of... Uh, bunch of... Uh, task or performed by workers. So it's always a good thing to, to check that uh, you have enough workers and that they are healthy. Uh, side note, for example, for the emailing, you can see that we have multiple workers. Uh, if you have a large user base, uh, you will probably need to have multiple email workers so that mail gets sent faster. And now the diagnostic page, uh, this is where a lot of uh, things uh, can be done and can be shown to you regarding the status of your MISP instance. So this is where you can see your version of MISP and the latest available version. And if you've installed MISP uh, correctly, following our install guide, uh, you should be able to just update your MISP instance by just clicking this button. Uh, then you have information about the soup modules, if they are up to date or not. We'll cover that in a minute. And then start the diagnostic part uh, where it lists everything that could go wrong. Propose uh, also recommendation about security. For example, it says that uh, the config.php config file is readable for any user, which should not be the case. For Redis, we don't have a password set. So it really provides uh, guidance on how to better secure your MISP instance. So really, truly amazing stuff. Uh, take your time to go through all of these uh, items and fix them if you think they are uh, relevant to your case. Uh, so PHP settings, uh, always good to also check that the max execution time and memory limit are correctly set. So MISP is a very specific case of an application. Usually web server tend to have a very slow execution time uh, so that they are able to process a lot of requests rapidly. Uh, in the MISP case, it's the opposite. Uh, we have long-lasting operation, large queries, uh, whenever you search for uh, data or whenever you uh, synchronize stuff. Uh, so making sure that you have enough execution time and enough memory uh, it's always a good thing. So for example, you can see that this server is configured to only have one gigs of memory uh, and it is considered to be low and we recommend at least two gigs. Uh, so this is something that should be fixed for this server. Uh, some diagnostic about the PHP extension, about the database, about the schema. Uh, 
So I will not go through all of these uh, discrepancy in the schema, but if you notice some weird behavior or weird error in your logs, uh, have a look at the schema status and check if you have any issues uh, shown there. Usually this table might not be that big uh, and issue can happen with this, uh, with this schema status if you are using MISP since a long time and so for example, I don't know, let's say 2017. Uh, and so some update didn't went well, for example. So you would be able to see some, uh, some issue shown here. Um, but if it's uh, almost new installation or if everything went fine, this table would be empty and would not even be, be shown. Um, this is also quite new. So recommendation on how you should configure your SQL database. Uh, if you are seeing that your MISP is slow, especially for loading large events and so on, uh, please have a look at that, uh, uh, at that section. It really recommends you some uh, uh, interesting settings such as the InnoDB buffer pool size, uh, which as you can see is recommended to be quite high compared to what we currently have. Uh, so yeah, have a look at that and then information about some uh, other components such as Redis, uh, which is mainly used Redis to, to contain information about the cache of uh, remote data. So for example, feed caches and server caches. And then diagnostic about uh, like uh, GNU-PG, 0MQ, the module system and so on. Some administrator uh, on demand action that can be done. So for example, to, to perform the migration of the authorization keys from the old system to the new one, uh, you can also do it via this button. All right. Um, now, how to update MISP? Well, if file permission is correct and the installation went fine. It's kind of easy. You just click on update MISP. And what this will do, it will fetch the latest version of the source code on the GitHub rep repository. So pull it locally. And then it will apply all database update that needs to be done. And once it's, uh, it's done, it will then update all the different JSON libraries that we have and load them into MISP. What do I mean by that? If you remember yesterday, uh, we went over the taxonomies. Um, and these taxonomies, uh, their definition is stored in a GitHub repository. So whenever you will update your MISP, you also have to fetch the new definition or the update for this definition. So when you pull from GitHub, you will receive the new uh, JSON libraries that contain these definitions. But then you need to load this definition into MISP. And to do it, you can either do it manually by clicking on Update Taxonomies, this button here. Uh, and this is the same for taxonomies, galaxies, MISP objects, and so on and so forth. So you have to load them their definition into MISP. But if you use this update button, it will do it automatically. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, I think that cover quite enough about it. Uh, let's check if we have questions. We had, we had some questions yeah. I answer some, but um, they were very good questions regarding uh, redeployment versus pooling. Um, the update of MISP really highly depends on how you install it. Um, nevertheless, I mean, a MISP instance, which is a standalone system or virtual machines and so on, you get pool and you get the latest version, you log in and everything is fine. No, if you have um, Kubernetes, uh, Docker, maybe some other model of, 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 of deployment for MISP, uh, then in this case, uh, you need to use a redeployment mechanism that is recommended by the deployment that you, you did. So for example, I know for some RPM packages, uh, you need to do, re do redeployment. 
uh, to have the latest version, the right RPM packages version, and so on, um, which is a bit different than doing the, the update automatically from the instance. Um, so it's 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 a matter of deployment, um, and I've seen various ways of doing it. I think there is not a perfect way to do it. It's really depending. Nevertheless, MISP is, I think, quite clever on that aspect. Um, if you basically have an old instance uh, and you need to, uh, to update it and you have only way to get internet access and, uh, and being able to do a git pool, you can basically do an update uh, automatically. The rest will be uh, automatically handled by the MISP instance. But nevertheless, don't forget about your own deployment, then it might be different. Then. I see a question about overriding any custom changes. Uh, if you mean custom changes like changing the source code of MISP, well, you will not be able to update your MISP because you will have an issue with a merge. You will have a merge conflict, most probably. Uh, or at least you will not be able to pull it because you would have local change uh, in your files. Uh, if you mean changes about, for example, new definition in taxonomies or even new widget we didn't cover the widget for the dashboard yet uh, but all of these kind of things if you put them in the correct directory uh, it, you would not have any issues because we have dedicated directory that are not tracked by git so you can pull it and it will be uh, it will work out of the box Uh, yeah, so, so if you have a standard MISP, and usually you can customize a lot of things in MISP, like templating and so on, but this has no impact on, on the on the system itself. I mean, JSON files and so on, that's fine. But indeed, source code, <laughs> usually you don't you don't do it. Uh, uh, nevertheless, maybe we can we can make a comment there. Uh, if you want to contribute something and so on, don't hesitate to do pull request uh, on the MISP repository, even if it's not perfect. That's that's fine for us. Because maybe we want, we might re rewrite it because sometimes it's a good idea. So I've seen some people that wanted like very some minor changes, like uh, I don't know, templating view and so on, and they make a pull request on the on the repository, uh, and then we 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 integrate it. So you, usually it's better that, uh, in that way. Uh, yeah, I saw a question about synchronization. Um, so if you pull an event from another MISP instance and you modify it locally, I will stop here because it's a, not a good idea to modify an event that does not belong to you. Uh, unless you attach uh, local tags. I think this is the only, only, uh, the only case where it makes sense to modify uh, other events. Otherwise, you should go the proposal uh, route, like create a proposal and uh, request a creator event, uh, or in the event creator organization to uh, to update it. But anyway, if you want, if for any reason you change uh, and you modify an event that do not belong to you, that was fetched from another server, uh, it will not be propagated back to the other instance. First of all, because if it's fetch and you don't have the push right to push it, you will not be able to, to push the changes. And even if you have the right to push data to, to the instance from which you got the event, uh, the update will be rejected uh, because it will not accept changes for event uh, the, where, if the event was created on that instance. I hope that was more or less clear. But basically, if you create an event on your instance and you push it, uh, you will not be able to receive modification for event that was created on this instance by uh, other MISP instances. Uh, well, you have a protective mechanism for that. Uh, there is uh, a question from, from, from Askur regarding, is there any official guide to deploy MISP instance in cloud and with integration with other incident response tools such as uh, the Hive? Uh, there's no official guide for that. Uh, we have plenty of documentation for installation and so on. Uh, we don't have an official one for uh, Azure. I know some on the internet or even some video for describing that, uh, but we don't have one that is an official one. Uh, for the Hive, there is even a documentation for the integration with MISP, which is public on their on their website. 
Um, but I mean, for cloud deployment and so on, for Azure, there are some script of deployment for, for the image. Um, there is even some ID for deployment image of, of MISP that you need to update because as far as I know, it's just like older version of MISP. But uh, we don't provide. On the other hand, if you, uh, if you take the time to do one, one uh, for doing such kind of thing, we would be interested to share it with others. Um, because there are, there are a lot of documentation regarding this that we don't, I would say, control uh, regarding deployment. Um, but that's a, maybe a good opportunity to quickly talk about deployment. Um, uh, I don't know if Sammy, you, you want to, to quickly show the slide for, for that. Um, because there are, there are some, I think, important aspects. Um, Oops, give me one second. Yeah, sure. No worries. Up. So, so for the Azure part, um, there is not that much. There is for Amazon. Uh, for Azure, I think it's quite new. There is some integration with uh, uh, Microsoft Intelligence um, connectors and stuff like that, um, but not directly for the cloud deployment. So, if you do a, a guide, feel free to share it with us. We will be interested to to share it with others. Um, so. There are different models of deployments. Obviously, one is native installations. Uh, I mean, at Circle, for example, is oh, we do it. We have, we we do ma manual installations. We are used to it, but I mean, deploying a MISP from scratch uh, with a standard uh, Ubuntu distributions. Uh, if you are used to install a, a Unix software and a MySQL database credential and stuff like that, uh, in less than one hour, it's done. Uh, nevertheless, if you are um, uh, less uh, used to that, there is an automatic installation script too uh, that is doing all the install. Uh, we produce some VM, virtual, uh, virtual box and, and VMware that you can use. We don't use those one in production, but those one are, are nice for testing and so on. Um, there is uh, some script like Ansible and so on, which are not official one, but they are very good. There's uh, guys called Juju uh, for on GitHub, which is providing a, a responsible uh, deployment, which is quite good and maintained. Uh, Docker, you have like, I don't know, four or five um, Docker model because they are like, I would say, four or five different church of how oh, you should manage Docker. But there is one that is, I think, quite maintained and quite good, this cool acid one. Um, yeah, and that you, you have the slide there. Uh, there is one which is a one where all the component is within a single Docker image, is the uh, one from the Mertens. Um, this one we even we 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 use it for some testing and demonstration. There's an older one from Harvard Security, uh, but I think this one is not that much maintained. Um, on the other, uh, someone is asking: Is the Docker image uh, use no correlation engine and work workflow enables? It's pretty straightforward. If you have a normal Docker uh, installations, uh, if there is no no new redeployment script, you can just like uh, pull the latest version of MISP and you basically have workflow and, and new correlations. Uh, Nick said that the Xavier Mertens version is nice too. Yeah, so it's really a matter of test. Uh, they are uh, on the internet Kubernetes one. You have even already ready uh, MISP images and some uh, some um, uh, LHC and so on. For example, we are deploying MISP on on uh, LXC uh, images, and that's pretty straightforward to do uh, too. So there are many ways of doing deployment of MISP. Uh, this of choice, and I think that's something quite important. Um, all our development, uh, virtual testing, and stuff like that are running on Ubuntu 20, 20, 2004. Um, 1804 will st still work too. Uh, it's really our target platform. We use it for integration and so on. So that means if it doesn't work on that one, that, that's like something that we need to obviously to fix. Nevertheless, uh, you have people that are running uh, CentOS, uh, Red Enterprise, and so on. Uh, this one is a bit, a bit more complex. Um, for Red Enterprise, we recently released RPM and thanks to a partner that uh, supporting us for that. Um, for uh, deploying or with Red Hat Enterprise. Um, those one are um, latest versions. You just need the Red Hat Enterprise, obviously, license to uh, install those and even to, do the, to, to have your build script uh, running on your own. Uh, those one are maintained. But if you want to be on the safe side and you're flexible on distributions, uh, Ubuntu is, is the one that we, uh, uh, we use internally. So ah, this one is, is, I think, the most common question that we have on chat, uh, even on direct message on Twitter and so on, 
what are the hardware spec? And sorry to say that, but it's like a lawyer answer. I would say it depends. <laughs> and uh, it depends for various things. It's depending on what you are putting into MISP. I mean, if you have like uh, putting and creating like 20 events per year and with like 200 attributes, obviously uh, Raspberry Pi will obviously uh, handle it without any problems. <laughs> Nevertheless, I mean, if you are using like half a billion of attributes on a, on a yearly basis and you have like uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, events, you might need to have a bigger machine. So what are the parameters that are important? You have two things that are really taking a lot of resources. You have the, uh, obviously the clustering of data. Uh, so um, disk speed is super important. So that's why we always recommend if you can go for SSD, go for SSD. Mechani mechanical disk is fine, but if you start to have like hundreds of users and you have like API being used by CM automatically and so on, obviously SSD is a big advantage. I mean, nowadays, server SSD is like normal, I would say, to use. Uh, another thing that is important is memory, RAM. Um, because when you do queries, you want to reconcile data. You might have filtering point and so on. That's quite important. Another thing that is important is the caching of feeds. Uh, for example, of one hour production intense, we cache all the feed that we have and is around 1.4 gigabyte of memory. So keep that in mind. It's a Redis cache. It's super fast. More RAM you have, it's better. It's better for the index and so on. Um, so that's quite important too. Um, <clears throat> another thing is, is if you do a lot of, of tagging, update and so on, disk speed is really important because it's basically high on high on the, on the um, uh, database system. So um, that's quite important too. Obviously, it's really depending. Uh, I, I can tell you, for example, that we operate uh, one of our MISP for um, uh, around 4,000 organizations with, uh, I think, 128 gigabytes of memory. And we just use, I think, 20% of the memory. Um, and we have like eight uh, CPU on that one. So eight, v, uh, eight cores. So, and it's manageable. Uh, and people are using API eight, and you have like a uh, hundred of MISP doing synchronization. So you see that you can scale. Uh, you don't need a cluster to run MISP, to be, uh, to be honest. Um, but if you start to have like a lot of queries and so on, don't hesitate to be... Uh, uh, I would say um, um, welcoming on the SSD aspect and performance of the disk uh, and on the memory. Uh, another thing is if you do virtual uh, virtual systems like VMware and so on, please don't use shared disk on that uh, because IOIs is really a, a huge penalty there. Uh, so please use uh, direct access disk and so on for 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 MISP. So also paste it in the in the chat the, the link to all the slides and especially this slide deck. Because it also includes some pointer on how you could better uh, create data in MISP to, to make it more efficient. So, for example, uh, the fact that blocking over correlating value uh, will reduce the amount of correlation that you have in your system, thus making it faster. Uh, the finish gestion strategy is all about how you can save custom feed into your instance. You might probably remember the discussion about the fixed event and the new event at each pool. Uh, this is what this is referring to. And for the over contextualization, another pointer is if you want to, to say that uh, uh, all attributes uh, are uh, from a specific incident like we did yesterday uh, are uh, part of, uh, I don't know, uh, the telecommunication sector, uh, instead of adding a tag to each of uh, every attribute of this event, just add it to the container itself, so add it to the event. Uh, because each time you add a tag, you create an entry in the database. And so creating tons of entries uh, where you could have just created one by tagging the event would save it a lot of disk, disk uh, space, uh, but also uh, uh, the event will be uh, like parsed and processed faster when you read it. Uh, yeah, other factors that can impact the number of users that are active. Uh, having a lot of users in an instance is not a big deal. It really depends on how active they are and what they are doing with the system. If they are just logging in the system and browsing the event, this is pretty lightweight. If they are performing heavy uh, queries against the system, uh, uh, that's it's a completely different story. Uh, should also review the logging strategy. So we have different uh, um, levels of logging. Uh, the default one is pretty pretty basic, but you can go more aggressively uh, in a, the paranoid mode, I would say, where everything will be saved on the disk. 
uh, this is great when you are debugging or when you have having issues or when you expect or suspecting full plays by your users. Uh, but if uh, at any point in time you you change your logging strategy to to be in the paranoid mode, don't forget to to reset it back to the default one because you might fill up your disk space quite rapidly. Um, yeah, heavy searches. I mentioned that. Uh, the worst one is to do by doing substring searches, obviously, because we cannot really rely on indexes for that. Uh, stuff that do not impact the performance is the usage of warning lists. So we don't cover warning lists that much, uh, but they are basically a way to prevent common false positives uh, to be exported. For example, a file of M a file, ashes of empty file uh, or for example, the IPv4 DNS resolver, public DNS resolver and stuff like that, these are most of the time false positive. So by enabling these warning lists and using them, you will reduce the amount of false positive. Uh, but people would think that using these uh, perform then uh, additional queries and thus uh, slow down your misinterpretation, but it's not the case at all. Warning lists are stored in a very fast lookup database, and the comparison is uh, and the uh, filtering of uh, uh, attribute that uh, trip uh, the warning list uh, is done uh, really fast. A number of attributes on an instance is not an issue also because we are using indexes. Uh, number of sync connection, recurring sync. Uh, this is something that. Uh, it's a bit that could feel weird uh, to say because you would expect that if a lot of synchronization uh, requests are sent to a miss server, it will like make it slow. But it's not the case. Uh, synchronization are clever enough to only uh, try to synchronize data that should be updated. Uh, so if you if you do a synchronization uh, query every hour, uh, it will not uh, like impact the performance of your instance at all. Uh, and yeah, tool feeding of the automation channel. So the, the ZeroMQ and Kafka, these are published subscribed channels. We'll cover quickly that tomorrow. Uh, but basically relying on these channels, it doesn't impact the, in the instance at all. Uh, yeah, so more authentication option, but I think we've covered that uh, in the qu question and so on. Uh, so we will skip it. PHP tuning. Uh, we've talked about the maximum memory usage and the time on settings uh, in the diagnostic session. We saw that. Uh, we also saw in the roles that you can set it per roles. So if you want to 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 uh, give some roles more memory or more uh, request time, you can do it. Uh, MySQL uh, optimization. Uh, now it's mentioned, but we have even a small section in the diagnostic uh, page in MISP that allows you to fine tune these uh, these aspects. So have a look at it. Uh, yeah, the general rule of the MISP, MISP is to to tune for heavy queries rather than the all the light one that you, we might have. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Mr. C has only got recommendation for MySQL, say tuning settings, absolutely. And I think these are great recommendations. Um, yes, if, if you want to do clustering and load balancing and so on, uh, have a look at that repository. Uh, I remember seeing that uh, that presentation at uh, one of the Miss Summit, I think it was three years ago or four years ago, I don't remember exactly, maybe three years ago. It was a really good presentation. So have a look uh, at that repository if you want to do, to deploy uh, MISP in AWS and provide like uh, load balancing and recovery. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for the deployment. Uh, now, before going into uh, the best practices to run a community, I just would like to, uh, to do a small teaser for tomorrow. Um, because we'll show in depth how to use MISP workflows. So I just want to, to show you what are the capabilities and also to show you how you can 
uh, use the brand new feature that was released a uh, few days ago, which is the periodic notification one that allows you to aggregate data and send periodic notification uh, to users like a uh, daily report, weekly report, and monthly report. So these features, I don't think they are in this training instance, so I will bring up my dev instance. Um, this is the periodic notification setting uh, that, that uh, you can have access to. If you go in list event, you can click on the view periodic summary and it will uh, show you a periodic summary. Uh, this is for daily, so it will show uh, uh, for uh, uh, data for, for, these, for these days. Uh, so you see uh, a detailed summary, you see the new correlation that were created, uh, you see the trending of tags uh, with a few periods, um, and then a bit of context summary where you see which taxonomies and galaxy were used, as well as uh, the famous Maitre attack matrix. And you can also do it for, uh, for a week. Um, where it, it, it shows the number of attributes that were added during this period of time, uh, the number of published events, uh, the top 10 MITRE attack techniques, uh, the top tags, the new correlation, and again, a bit of trending about tags and so on. So this is something that can be viewed in the user interface, but you can also configure MIST to send a periodic mail, uh, one every day, one every week, and one every month. Uh, and to configure that, you have to go into uh, my profile and then periodic summary setting, where you can, as a user, subscribe to the different uh, notification period. Uh, and you can even apply some filter to be used to, to, to only take some event into account. So if you want to only perform the summary for, I don't know, tags, uh, that's uh, for event that are tag with the uh, PAP red tag, you can do stuff like that. Uh, and also provide some additional settings for the report generation. Uh, and once you have subscribed to that, uh, as a site administrator, you have to review uh, this uh, section of the automation page, uh, because to be able to send the daily uh, notification summary to users. Uh, you have to run a, a, a comment every day. So this is a sample of one such comment that you could use. Uh, um, I'm sure Alex will paste uh, in the chat the, the blog post related to that to that feature so that you, you see what you can do and how you can set it up. Um, but yeah, that was a quick overview of this brand new feature that was released a few days ago. Now for the MISP workflow that we'll show uh, uh, tomorrow more in depth how it works and how you can use it. Uh, basically, if you go in administration and then workflow, uh, you have a list of triggers uh, in MISP. So triggers are basically just uh, action that happen in MISP that you can then perform additional actions. Uh, so for example, if an event is published, you can then request MISP to perform additional actions. Uh, and you can edit everything uh, in, that, uh, in that interface. So for example, uh, let's edit uh, this trigger. So whenever an event is published, uh, this is a bit messy, this is my dev instance. So don't worry too much about the different stuff that are there. Uh, but basically, uh, with this uh, interface, editor interface, you can configure the behavior that MISP takes whenever an event is published. So at the beginning, we have the publishing of an event, and then it checks if the event, if the distribution of the event is one of these sharing group. Uh, if it's the case, then it, it will check if the event is tagged with any of these tags. And if it is the case, it will stop the execution, meaning that the event will not be published. So this is a great way to automate stuff. In that case, uh, with this uh, condition that I've just that is just defined as this, it just prevents the publication uh, if these conditions are met. But you can do much uh, cooler stuff. Like every time an event is published, you can request, for example, to send uh, I don't know a message to a Mattermost channel. Uh, you can also say, okay, I want to send a mail 
that an event has been published only to not all accounts, but only to, to my account, where you can even set the email subject and the email body. Uh, you also have uh, Microsoft Teams webhooks to publish it, uh, generic webhooks that you can use. So you have a bunch of stuff that you can do. You have logic modules and so on. And you will see that how it works and the, the details on how you can configure it tomorrow. That was the, the small teaser. Uh, I will also paste the link uh, uh, for, uh, for the slides that explain this feature in depth. So if you are not able to join tomorrow, you, you will still be able to, to, to learn more about that, uh, that feature. There's, there's a very good point from JJ. Uh, was he was like mentioning that uh, uh, to use a workflow to prevent yes. untagged events from being published. That's exactly the example. That, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. I don't and Shimp is mentioning is, is there a trigger when specific event is changed, updated, or attributed editor to a specific event? And I'm sure Sami will say yes. Yes. Uh, so we have uh, an after save event. That means that everything. Uh, well, that something happened. For example, if uh, an attribute was added, then you, it will inevitably change the timestamp of the event. And so it will trigger, it, it will run this trigger. Uh, same for if an attribute is, uh, is saved. So you can see we've provided a small hint about the potential overhead that running a trigger might uh, imply on your instance. Uh, so if you try to, I will enable it and it's it's high in red. So it's absolutely not recommended uh, to, uh, well, I would not say that it's not recommended, but it's not advised to use this trigger to do some specific action, especially if these actions uh, include uh, significant overhead. Because let's say that you, you apply uh, an action that would send a request to uh, a web service, for example, for every attribute that are being saved, you would have to wait that this web service returns, which can in introduce a significant delay every time an attribute is saved. And you can guess what that would lead if you try to synchronize a large event composed of, I don't know, 10,000 attributes, the amount of delay that that would introduce would be insanely high. So really think about what you are doing. We just provide guide, guidelines, guidelines like a more uh, hints about the potential impact of using such trigger. Uh, but yeah, now you're advised and you know what that it could significantly uh, slow down your instance. There's a question uh, from Ethan about uh, social oh. workflow. Maybe last ah. question before we go for the community. Yeah, absolutely. So last question about this, and then I will answer all questions about workflows in the chat if you want. Uh, so on publish, if it has these tags, uh, let's have a look what we can do. So on publish, if it has a tag, let's go in the logic. Uh, if tags. So if the event is tag with, let's say, TLP green, that kind of condition you can express. Stop if publish user is not some users. Yeah. You can do it, but not with this kind of widget. We have uh, if generic, uh, that is a bit uh, trickier to use. But basically, if you know the user ID and the user ID is 44, uh, you can say that uh, event dot user ID, uh, then you can express that like this, uh, if that's possible. I think. Uh, so I get, at least you, you have the ID. You can perform generic queries against the, the data that is passed. And so basically in that case, uh, blocking, oops. So in that case, with this workflow, you have, okay, if an event is published and it's tagged with, TLP, with PAP green and the user has the ID 42, then stop the execution, so prevent the publishing. Um, yeah, and so for additional documentation, you have it in the interface. So if you click on this eye icon, uh, you have documentation about the workflow, but also how to use HashPath, how it works, basically. All right, that's it for workflow. Uh, Alex, do you want to share oh, the that... screen or do you want me to show the slides? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can share it. That was great. I mean, very nice. 
<laughs> in a very quick way you show you can do it it's, it's really cool awesome so you should be able to share your screen now yes 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 technology seems to be with me today <laughs> Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Um, so we still have like around 20 minutes uh, until that we uh, um, uh, finish the sessions. And what I want to, to do today, and it's, it's, it's passed on, on the experience that we, we have not only with MISP itself, but MISP as a tour experience and how we are using it as a third. Uh, maybe you can steal some idea there when you are when operating your own community and, and how to do it. Um, is not like I would say ground rules or I would say golden rules, but it's more like things that we have seen, properties during uh, creation of such community that has been, uh, uh, I would say, uh, discovered. Um, but, you know, just take what is useful for you from, from these presentations. Um, so it's really focusing on the use cases as uh, the CIRT at Circle. We, we are doing various things and I will I will explain that. And how we use MISP uh, from the early beginning to the current usage that we have on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis. And out of that, we have seen some, I would say, outcome of, of how to better build the communities, uh, including some mistakes that we did or that others did and what uh, other thing that did uh, work in, in the meantime. Um, so, First of all is um, we operate, obviously, uh, uh, MIS for different communities. Um, as a CSIRT, we operate and we act as a kind of Isaac for different communities. Uh, but obviously, we use MIS not only for that, but we use it as an internal tool to cover our operations. Uh, we had to quickly make a MIS pivot to share back the information. So for us, it's really a pivotal tool. It's really the core tools for uh, doing incident response too. And especially to to share information. Um, so the thing is, it's kind of of I would say awkward, but we are the developer of the tool, but we are the same user of the tool. So we are kind of eating our own dog food, and and by doing so, um, we are able to find out uh, use cases and so on, and improving the software. Uh, what Sammy was showing with the workflow and so on is obviously uh, something that is uh, coming from our uh, use cases and so on. But nevertheless, communities have different models. Uh, we are one model, but there are plenty of models worldwide. And I think in the community and the people joining this training today, they are asking different kind of, of people, different models there. Um, so um, just to see what kind of community that we are operating, and I think we already discussed that uh, Yesterday, we were operating pretty large community for the private sector where different organizations are there and so on. Uh, because sometimes you have organizations or people that want to contribute. They don't know in which community they fit. But for us, they are falling back into this private sector community. And we have even, for example, security researchers uh, or malware researchers that want to talk about or share information. Then they fall back into that community. So it's really interesting for us. It's kind of kind of central up for various use cases. And you have a lot of, lot of diverse community. This one is pretty active. You have like uh, sometimes uh, sometimes hundreds of events that are created on a daily basis, um, uh, and it's giving us a lot of insight of of, of the following. Then we have, I would say, smaller one or the one with a tighter community, like the one for the CSIRT community that you operate, where it is really bound to what CSIRT are doing and incident response and cyber security. So you you will really see, for example, things about disinformation campaign and things like that is really focusing on, on that aspect. But those two communities, for example, that we operate are connected through MISP. So we share some events from one community to the others. Uh, so like that, we can uh, be sure that other community could share and get the information. Then we have uh, other community that we operate where um, people are not only sharing cybersecurity information, but really non-cyber threat related information, physical security. Uh, for example, in the financial sector, we have some community where they are only sharing information about really specific threats that are uh, links to buildings, infrastructures of banks and so on, which are not at all say, cyber security. Um, we cooperate another one called Cross Isaac, um, which is a way to share information between the IDAC. Um, uh, so my Isaac are already participating in that one. It's, it's one way to bridge uh, indicators and in sharing information there too. 
Um, another thing that we, 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 we are supporter on is, is coming from the past year of an investigation with MISP and so on, is sometimes we lack uh, contextual information in some MISP instances, and especially some events. Uh, so that's why we, we are uh, starting this community with other partners uh, um, for having a kind of uh, European community about attack. Uh, is the attack community uh, maybe some of you are already member of that one uh, it's really a community of, of people using attack and how they use it obviously misp is one of the big users of attack because it's one of the galaxy that we use but it's really a way to standardize ttp and information within misp and so on so have a look at this an event in uh, in in some weeks uh, to join in and you see a lot of organizations we have already some many slides of organizations uh, using attack uh, on a daily basis and we, we have seen an evolution over time of people using MISP that are using more and more attack which is really giving a lot of insight so uh, uh, don't refrain to use the attack really use it it's really giving a lot of help not only for us but we are even share back the sightings back to attack community and to attack uh, at large so to my trade and they can reuse those informations to see which kind of techniques are more prominent and used nowadays uh, we 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 co-manage different uh, different communities in the telecom mobile operators for example we we co-manage the one from gsma uh, which is a ti isaac one um, which is a very specific one to mobile operators uh, and that's why we have for example a lot of of, of uh, objects that are covering such kind of community for us it's very important to join and support those community because it's a way to extend the MISP object template that we have in misp uh, to support such, such kind of use case and sometimes we even operate um different communities um so for example during exercise like log shield for example a network exercise um where um uh, it's kind of synthetic data but then we can even be sure that our uh, models and so are applicable so running exercises using misp help us to 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 ensure uh, ensure that um so other thing that we we we, we want the, there it's to support is the different sharing mechanism um, today, I will talk quickly with you different sh sh sharing mechanism, or at least sharing scenario that we have as a CSIRT. Uh, is not all of them uh, that are, can be used with MISP, but it's just to show you what we can do with MISP. So if you look at the CSIRT, there are four main activities in the CSIRT, which are what we call core services in season response and so on. You have sometimes proactive services like actively sharing or discovering vulnerabilities before the incident happens. Then you have advanced services, which are more like dedicated services that the CSIRT can provide to their members. And obviously sharing community. So it's really the four main groups that we are um, seeing there. As a circle, we see it as a task in the CSIRT. So for example, if we look at all things are structured in an incident response team, if we look at incident response, you usually have internal storage where we store incidents, activities. Um, obviously, when you start to have incident and so on, you want to share information. Always starting with an incident and so on, sharing is becoming kind of key element. I mean, like five or six years ago, it was less. But nowadays, sharing is really Um, and uh, you can really use the collaboration mechanism. So more people that are doing incident response with you can get access to your instance for the for, for the system that we are running. And we see people are starting to collaborate early on. So it's not like at the end of the case, but at the early beginning of the case. And that's really super, super important because it's really helping coordination and collaboration. And even, for example, for takedowns, we even give access to some ISPs uh cloud providers and so on to our platforms from the attackers is not really helping for the case but it's maybe helping others to know about this infrastructure so that that at the same time we provide and we share additional uh, information so we are a so if you do some reversing and so on okay we, we we send it back into um into um into MISP 
so like that people can benefit from it. For example, we have huge spam traps that we are collecting from uh, spear phishing and so on, and we collect that into MIS. So automatically, we can get this correlation from other MIS instances. So like that, we can, for example, find the initial infections, or at least the initial reference of a potential peer phishing campaigns when we are working on investigations. So sometimes, when collecting a lot of information early on using MISP and other MISP instances 